Hello and welcome back. I'm Tim Willoughby here with Ian Duke. It is now time for more constructed here at Pro Tour Dragons of Tarkir. Round 12, the players are already in the feature match area. They're already raring to go. I think we should go down and see some more magic. of Tarkir. I'm Tim Willoughby here with R&D member Ian Duke and we have a packed feature match area. We can see already a couple of games started but the game that we're going to be starting on on camera on the left of your screen you've got Justin Cohen. Justin finishing second at Pro Tour Fate Reforged looking to go one better here and he will be he's just checking something with the judge there but he will be up against uh, Andrew Cunio. Uh, Long-time veteran of the game, one of the true original classic control players, and he's very much playing to type in these constructed rounds here in Duke. He's playing blue-white control. Yeah, Andrew Cunio is a player who's known for his love of slow, ponderous control decks, uh, and this is uh, no change from the course. Uh, he's playing blue-white control here. It's a typical control deck with lots of counter spells and removal. Um, He's got a couple Oju ties in here, but uh, largely straight away from the full dragon package. So he's not playing dragon reveal cards and such. Uh, Justin on Cohen, on the other hand, uh, he tested with Team Ultra Pro and a lot of the Madison, Wisconsin folks. Uh, they're on this, what we call Red Green Bees, I think we've been calling it. Yeah, this is kind of an interesting deck. And in some respects, it's Justin Cohen playing to type two, because I mean, Thinking about what he did at Pro Tour Fate Reforged, he played a deck that was a little bit out on the on the edges there. We see a, a Radiant Fountain gaining two life for Andrew Cunio. Uh, yeah, he played um, the Amulet deck there, which was one of those decks that had fantastic matches against people who weren't prepared. And this Red Green Bees deck, it's kind of doing the same thing. It's got lots of ways of making the most out of Hornet Queen and indeed Hornet Nest. Uh, it's got, we see there, a Court of Calling in Cohen's hand that might potentially be able to get a Hornet Nest over and above the one he already has. Um, the slight worry for Justin Cohen here, the team has already told us it's not necessarily the greatest deck against control. Yeah, that's what it looks like to me here, looking at the deck list. The shell of the deck is sort of a red-green ramp um, type deck here. It's not really capable of aggressive starts, so he's not going to be able to beat down very effectively against Andrew's control deck. Um, that said, he's got a couple useful tools here. Um, things like Planeswalkers and Whisperwood Elemental can be valuable to him against a blue-white control deck. But I think largely the early game is going to be seeing both players develop their mana um, and then Cohen trying to maneuver to resolve something uh, that can give him a long-term advantage. And actually, Corsair of Crufix is a good start to this. Yeah, we saw the Sylvan Carrier to here from uh, Justin Cohen, and it does mean that he's able to get the Corsair Crufix into play and then play a land subsequently to gain that life on his uh, third turn. Uh, but really, the things that the, the biggest tricks that his deck has to play are on decks that are going to get hurt, particularly by 1-1 one, one Death Touch Bs. A Valorous Stance there, dealing with Corsair Crufix pretty much just as soon as it comes into play for Andrew Kinnear there. Yeah, and Corsair of Crufix is uh, one, of the, one of the cards that Andrew definitely needs to get off the table. If left in play, it'll give uh, Justin Cohen valuable card advantage um, going into a longer game. And that's one thing that Andrew just wants to shut down as soon as he can. Now, this match, it's our first match on camera, but it's not the first match to complete a game in the feature match area. Uh, you have notable s speedy player Shota Yasuoka playing blue-black control up against notable speedy deck uh, Mono Red being played by Martin Dang. Martin Dang already a game up there on the King of the Hill table. Over here, though, we see at the moment it is very much the development stage in this game, and I think that reasonably the fireworks we can expect to happen a little bit later. Yeah, so right now, I it looks to be we're in Andrew's main phase here, and he's cracking a fetch land. So I wonder if we're going to see something like a Dragonlord Ojutai come down. I was the only one playing without the lands. And uh, we'll take a look at his hand for you shortly as we get that updated. Um, right now, we have a peek at Justin Cohen's hand. Uh, he's sitting on a couple powerful cards like Chandra Pyromaster and Storm Breath Dragon and some Court of Callings that he can use to, uh, to tutor up some threats. So this is kind of interesting. Uh, Andrew Cunio, normally when we think of the way that he plays, it's very much draw-go. Those two words effectively the cliff notes on the user's manual for control decks. But in this case, it looks to be that he's actually going on a somewhat more aggressive line. He's casting map of the way, so they're getting four warrior tokens. And that means that he's able to potentially put, uh, sorry, secure the waste there uh, for four warrior tokens, potentially put a little bit of pressure on Justin Cohn here. 
So that was my mistake earlier. That was actually the end of Justin Cohen's turn. Andrew Cuneo took the opportunity to secure the wastes for four soldier tokens. Uh, Justin Cohen, in response, used a cord of calling while Andrew Cuneo was tapped out uh, to develop an elvish mystic. Uh, it looks like he was a little bit stuck on mana there. He wants to get up to the point where he can resolve something like a Planeswalker or a Storm Breath Dragon. Uh, so Andrew Cuneo making interesting use of Secure the Wastes here. This is a card that we normally associate more with like a Jeskai Tokens type deck. Um, but he's using it here in control just to provide him with an instant speed threat. So he can play draw go, and if his opponent isn't doing anything and isn't playing to his counter spells, he can get a little bit of a board presence with some soldier tokens. I mean, thinking about it, this isn't necessarily so unprecedented for control. You did see the likes of um, Gabriel Nassif playing De uh, Decree of Justice in his blue-white control deck at Worlds a number of years ago now. Uh, being able to make creatures at instant speed is the kind of speed that Andrew Cunio wants to be able to make them, because it means he's not having to tap out at any point other than when he really wants to, which is the end of his opponent's turn. Exactly. And speaking of instant speed, Andrew Cunio opts to dig through time at the end of Justin Cohen's turn here. Uh, and again, just being able to leave his mana open for counter spells to threaten counter spells turn after turn makes Justin Cohen it makes this uh, situation really difficult because his deck largely plays at sorcery speed with the exception of Court of Calling. If he wants to resolve something impactful in the matchup, he needs to do it on his own turn and Andrew Cunio can just leave up counter mana for that. Yeah, and if we look at uh, Andrew Cuneo's hand, more or less everything that's in there is instant speed. I can see an anticipate in there. There's a negate here for that Court of Calling. He's got an end hostilities if things get really dicey, but in the meantime, negate and disdainful stroke will deal with most spells as they get cast. Dig through time, we'll find him more cards. This is a great spot for Andrew Cuneo. So I think what Andrew's going to want to do here is just continue pressuring with his soldier tokens, leaving up counter mana to make sure that uh, Justin Cohen doesn't resolve anything like a Planeswalker uh, or a powerful creature like Stormbreath Dragon. And eventually Cohen's just going to have to play out a lot of smaller threats uh, in order to keep pace with the soldier tokens, and that's where end hostilities can come in and really sweep his board. Yeah, the Hornet Nest here, not necessarily the card that's best in this exact matchup, but on this exact board state, it does represent quite a useful blocker here. It's going to be able to block a, a warrior token, make a 1-1 insect uh, from having taken a point of damage. And actually, the interaction with Chandra Pyromaster, really powerful. You can start pinging your own hornet nest oh, in order to make cool. uh, bees. Uh, but and in point of fact here, Andrew Cunio says, I'm having none of that. I've got a negate for your planeswalker. Yeah, well equipped with uh, two copies of negate, now down to one, and also a disdainful stroke. So Andrew will make sure that no powerful threatening cards can resolve. And... I mean, he's fine just saying pass here and not attacking to that hornet nest. It's really no threat to him. Well, there's a set sand tactics in Justin Cohen's hand, which is another way of potentially forcing damage onto that hornet's nest. Obviously, more powerful if you're talking about a fight with a bigger creature, but in some respects, just being able to use set sand tactics as a way of getting rid of a creature and getting one on your own side, none too shabby nonetheless. And So here uh, comes Ash Cloud Phoenix for Cohen. I think this is going to meet a disdainful stroke. Uh, that is... Uh, oh, and anticipate in response, probably to follow up with a disdainful stroke afterwards, but Andrew Cunio wisely getting as much information as he can before committing to using this counterspell or deciding which counterspell to use, as the case may be. Um, Ashcloud Phoenix is definitely a creature that Andrew wants to counter uh, because he has end hostilities as his backup plan, but the Phoenix, of course, can come back uh, from the graveyard after an end hostilities. And he has now set himself up with Elspeth Sun's champion off the top. So in some respects, previously he might have been a little bit hesitant to use end hostilities because it would have left him without a way to continue to pressure Justin Cohen's life total. But with that uh, Elspeth Sun's champion in hand, he can potentially say, well, I don't mind too much if I lose my warriors here because actually I've got a great follow-up. He's got a dissolve there for that Xenagos the Reveler, so that's not going to be any help for us, Justin Cohen here. And... Everything that Cohen prophesied about this matchup not being a good one for him seems to be coming true, even if the details are perhaps a little different between blue-white and blue-black. And this is playing right into the way that Andrew Cunio wants to shape this matchup. I mean, Justin Cohen has a limited number of uh, threatening cards in this deck. Um, so much of his deck is metagamed against aggro, things like the Hornet Nest and removal spells that just aren't really useful against Andrew Cunio. So Cun all Cunio has to do is make sure, again, that these Planeswalkers don't stick. Um, or something like a Storm Breath Dragon. And in the meantime, he's just drawing cards at instant speed, uh, gathering a little bit of card advantage so he can trade one for one his counters with Justin Cohen's uh, few powerful cards in his deck. And we see there enough counters that he can stop pretty much anything that Justin Cohen has going for the next 
considerable number of turns. Uh, Andrew Cunio here, in principle, able to control the tempo of this game and draw it out for as long as he wants before he wins. But in point of fact, he may just decide that he wants to kind of finish things off comparatively soon. So one of the things I'm interested to see is whether Cunio tries to bleed Justin Cohen dry a little bit and allow him to keep playing out a few more threats, uh, maybe let another creature resolve and cast end hostilities before landing his Elspeth, or if he just decides that he's got enough control of the game and he wants to play the Elspeth out there while he can and while things aren't threatening. Um, I think Andrew Cunio being the patient player that he is, he's just going to bide his time a little bit, try to maybe counter or trade for one or two more cards from Justin Cohen, and when Cohen seems to be out of gas that's when he'll end hostilities and afterwards play the Elspeth. Patience very much the watchword for the control player. You, you need to be able to sort of eke out as much advantage as you can from things like mass removal spells or planeswalkers. And he's not really under any pressure here. He is able to just sort of say, I'm going to keep crafting my hand, getting it a little bit better. Mm -hmm. One thing that control normally wants to do is play lots of lands. And right now, it's not as if Andrew Cunio is particularly ahead on land drops, though with card drawing, he should be able to consistently get there. So we'll take a look at Andrew's hand. He has the Elspeth that we talked about, uh, Devouring Light, a couple more counter spells, uh, and of course the End Hostilities as a backup plan just in case things start to go south. Uh, but yeah, I think all Andrew wants to do is just keep making his land drops. Um, he, he's been able to find more dig through times with his dig through times, so as long as he can continue chaining those together, uh, he's just going to be way up on action cards over Justin Cohen. And for those of you that were worried that the control decks currently, I guess, in the feature match area are a game down, though Andrew Cunio looks pretty good in this one. Uh, Palo Vitor Damodarosa, he's playing blue-black control in the feature match area against Hall of Famer uh, Makihito Mahara playing black-green Constellation. He's picked up his first game there, so PV from Brazil back on our text table has got one game there. He's one up. The other match we have in the feature match area this round is an Absan control mirror, that between fellow Italians Marco Camaluzzi and Andrea Mengucci. That is a full 75 card mirror. Those two potentially test a little bit together. They know the matchup very, very well. And I'm sure that the judge there in the background is having to deal with all of the Italian banter that's going on between those two because both good fun players in the feature match area. So Andrew digging through time here. Uh, looks like he picks up a Dragonlord Ojitai. Notably, both copies of Dragonlord Ojitai were in that dig through time set there. He chose one uh, to put in his hand. The other is on the bottom. Um, so that's one of Andrew's few ways of deciding a game in a relatively quick fashion, the other one being um, Elspeth, and I guess Secure the Wastes. Um, but I'll be interested to see if he decides to start ending the game, and he does with uh, Elspeth, Sun's Champion. And that, I guess, one of the things that characterizes control as well. It can afford to have a few very, very powerful threats to end the game with, because the idea is almost that at the point that they get deployed, you've got nominal control over whatever else it is your opponent might be doing. Yeah, especially with a card like Dig Through Time, where you can relatively easily sift through your deck and find those, you know, one, two, three copies of your finishers. So he does go for Elspeth here at a point where he's on nine mana, which means he can leave three mana up for his copy of Dissolve uh, in his hand. Justin Cohen there drawing a roast, and this kind of absolutely typical of the issue that he's having in this matchup. He's, he's drawn a removal spell that's great in so many other matchups in this format, but here it's a one mana removal spell that is going to deal with one of a huge number of different uh, soldiers or, and or warriors on the board, or indeed making quite a lot of insects. Yeah, and this is the backup plan for having cards like Hornet Nest and Roast in his deck against a control deck. You know, normally those cards are really effective against aggro, but don't do much against control. If you combine them together, he can at least get some hornets uh, out of the hornet nest, which still isn't at its best against a control deck, but he can make use of them here. Yeah, I mean, the important thing to note, while the hornets, are also the insect tokens, are very, very powerful against regular aggressive creature strategies where a 1-1 one -one death touch is smaller, but just as lethal to other creatures as something bigger. In this case, a 1-1 one -one insect just trades naturally with a 1-1 one -one soldier anyway. It didn't need that death touch. So here comes the Stormbreath Dragon that Justin Cohen's been sitting on for much of the game. Um, he finally decides to deploy it here to try to uh, get in at Elspeth while he can. Andrew Cunio declines to counter the Stormbreath Dragon, and that indicates that he's going to uh, end hostilities next turn, which is, is great for him. It allows him to end hostilities, clear the board, and then leave up counter magic as well. Uh, for whatever Justin Cohen has as a follow-up, plus he gets to keep his Elspeth in play. So this is where we're really seeing Andrew Cunio make uh, some decisive plays that are going to lead him toward the end of the game. 
I do wonder whether or not the decision to play blue-white rather than blue-black was partly based around the fact that End Hostilities does everything it does. Firstly, it destroys all creatures. You don't need to worry about there being a dragon, non-dragon split like with Crux of Fate. Also, it does deal with the likes of Bestow for those players that have gone really, really deep with Chromanticore in their decks uh, in this tournament. Yeah, it's interesting you should mention Crux of Fate and the blue-black control decks. Um, Crux of Fate does make you choose between dragon and non-dragon, and often this can be an advantage if you build your deck around it and you choose to use dragons as your own finisher, like Silumgar the Drifting Death. You can effectively wrath the board except for your own creature. However, it also comes up often that you can't wrath your opponent's entire board if they have a split of dragon and non-dragon creatures, and that comes up most often against these red-green decks with Stormbreath Dragon. So, Corsair Crufix has managed to sneak into play here, revealing a, a, a Court of Calling on the top of Justin Cohen's deck. That one that uh, Cuneo not too worried about. He has now got the Elspeth engine online. He's gained a little bit more life with that Radiant Fountain there. And the team is just growing for him each and every turn as Elspeth ticks her loyalty back up after having taken that hit from Stormbreath Dragon. A devouring light there, using the freshly made soldiers to convoke out a removal spell, meaning that Andrew Cuneo not having to tap out even if he is casting spells on his own turn. An interesting choice there. Yeah, so Cuneo actually attacked his soldiers into Justin Cohen's Courser of Crufix, inducing a block which allowed him to cast Devouring Light. I would certainly be pretty surprised there if I were Justin Cohen. Devouring Light's not really a card that's on my radar, so I would have felt safe blocking with the Courser. Um, not really a mistake on his part, but just interesting that Andrew um, used his soldiers in that way. And sure enough, Justin Cohen goes ahead and packs it in with Andrew Cuneo sitting on multiple counter spells behind an Elspeth. Um, there's really not much that his red-green mid-range deck can do there. So that's the end of our first game. We will be back with more Magic for you very, very shortly. But first, these messages. New Magic Online only Tempest Remastered set combines the best of Tempest, Stronghold, and Exodus into a brand new draft experience with events beginning May 6th. Sign up for Magic Online at mtgo.com. Standard is the name of the game at Dragons of Tarkir Game Day. Put what you've learned from watching the Pro Tour into action on April 18th and 19th at your local game store. Visit magic.wizards.com slash game day for more information. Hello and welcome back to round 12 of Pro Tour. Dragons of Tarkir here. While the players on our main match are shuffling up, we're going to get a little bit of a look in on one of our other matches. That can't be the King of the Hill match because Martin Dang has already defeated Shoti Yasuoka. We're going to see Palo Vitor Damodarosa against Makahito Mihara. Though actually it looks like they might just be drawing their opening hands for a new game. We might be able to see how this match starts. This is how Blue-Black Control pairs up against Black-Green Constellation. A mulligan to four for Mahara, very problematic for the Japanese Hall of Famer. But a turn one thought sees at least means that he knows what he's working with here, and it is a great card against control. Yeah, absolutely. So it looks like Paulo Vitor Damodorosa is on an Esper Dragon-based control here. Um, so that's sort of a different flavor from what Andrew Cuneo is piloting. Uh, he's leveraging more of a creature finisher suite, and that allows him to play um, cards like Silmgar's score and what we call the Dragon Reveal cards. And he does take that Slumgar Scorn. Not too impressive if you don't have a dragon between your hand and in play, but if you do, then it's just straight up Counterspell. One of the cards that has kind of really changed around the control decks in this format. Yeah, and it's actually a perfectly serviceable card too, um, just to run it out on turn two as sort of a Force Spike-like effect. Um, often in this format, decks aren't doing much on turns one or two. Maybe the first play is on turn three, and if you can Force Spike it, it's you know effectively as good as a Counterspell early in the game. I tell you what, if you're Mahara having to start on a four-card hand, this so far, but for the fact that he's not got very many cards left over, looks like a very wow. powerful constructed start. <laughs> so two lands, Thoughtseize, Sylvan Carried it, and Corsair of Crufix. That's just about the perfect opening sequence on a mulligan to four. Yeah, I think if that had been a land on top, it would have been actually just literal perfect. Yep. And Paolo Vittor Damodorosa here, he's not likely to miss any land drops anytime soon. This is kind of the hallmark of control decks, one of the things that they want to do. Um, but the fact that there's already threats down for Mahara, forcing Paolo Vittor Damodorosa to blink, I guess, he has to make a little bit of action here fairly soon. Yeah. Sees a whip of Erebos on the top of Makahito Mahara's deck. Drown in Sorrow, just dealing with that Elvish Mystic, but that good enough for PV. He knows that there's not a land coming for Mahara, at least 
unless it's underneath that um, Whip of Erebos to be played off the top of the deck. Yeah, Drown in Sorrow, uh, taking out just an Elvish Mystic might seem a bit rash, but given that Mihara started on four cards and uh, PV doesn't really have much else to do with his mana, I think he's happy just to trade one for one there, get a Scry in, um, and get the Drown of Sorrow out of his hand. I mean, it doesn't really look like it's going to be useful uh, anytime soon in this game, given the way it's played out so far, so I like that trade. But down comes Whip of Erebos. And Nykthos Shrine to Nyx, certainly throwing off my math in terms of the amount of mana that Makahito Mahara might be able to produce in any short space of time. Uh, that land potentially much more explosive than most you might find on the top of your deck. So despite Mahara's start with only four cards in his hand, um, Corsair of Crufix and Whip of Erebos on the table are two cards that you do not want to see resolve early in the game when you're playing a control deck. The Corsair can just provide card advantage and smooth out Mahara's draws. And the Whip, once it's on the table, is pretty hard to get off the table. And it, again, it's going to provide a long-term advantage for Mahara. So even though PV is not under any direct pressure, he's got a little bit of catching up to do against these powerful permanents that have already resolved and are difficult for him to remove. Mulligans to four, certainly not what you ever want in a game of Magic. But the funny thing about them is... The games that you win on a mulligan to four, those are the ones that you remember for years to come, especially at this sort of high stakes stage in a tournament like a Pro Tour. So here we're going to see if uh, PV decides to pull the trigger on a Hero's Downfall, I think it is, on the Courser, which um, it's a little bit hard to see what the rest of his hand is, but I think he probably is going to want to take that out if, out if he can. Yeah, there is an Utter End in there as well, but the Utter End could quite reasonably be pointed at that um, Whip of Erebos if needed, or indeed the Pelucranos that came out of Mahara's hand just the next turn. Ooh, here comes Dragon Lord Silumgar stealing that Pelucranos. Huge play for PV there. With Mahara low on resources, I mean, stealing the Pelucranos is like, you know, killing it plus adding a 5-5 five -five to the board. And uh, this threatens to end the game pretty quickly here, especially as PV untaps now with... Uh, potential for counter magic. As it turns out, PV has dig through time to reload in his hand, so Mihara completely empty handed at this point, and PV, he's got the biggest threats on the board, plus he's got a way of drawing into more action. Note also, I think that's a Haven of the Spirit Dragon that I see on PV's side of the table. This is a land you can sacrifice to return uh, a dragon or, or an Ugin Planeswalker from your graveyard to your hand. So that means that even if Mahara top decks an answer to the Silumgar, he's only going to have a few short turns before that Silumgar comes right back out of the graveyard um, and steals something from him again. And PV choosing a Crux of Fate amongst the cards from his Dig Through Time. Now, this is a situation where Crux of Fate is going to kill one of your creatures if you cast it for now. But basically, this is an insurance policy for the Brazilian Hall of Famer. Um, and it means that basically he's going to be pretty safe. You'll see in the corner there, the players in our, our main match are just getting started. We'll, we'll move back to that soon enough. But right now, I think that it's all too likely that PV is going to be able to kind of functionally lock up this game in the next couple of turns. We'll keep an eye in the corner. But for now, I think it will just stay and see how this one plays out. So a thought sees from Mahara revealing PV's hand a second Silumgar, this time the Drifting Death, the Crux of Fate that we know about. And uh, could you see that third card there, Tim? I couldn't quite make it out. PV hiding it away just as soon as he possibly can. But... It looks like, to be honest, the things that Mihara are having to worry about the most here, the permanents that are already in play. There is an ultimate price. That's the final card in Paolo's hand, and that will potentially be able to get rid of that troublesome um, Corsair Crew fix. But in point of fact, as long as Paolo Vittor Damarodorosa isn't uh, actually behind in terms of what's on top of Mihara's deck, he might just want to keep the extra information there. It makes it a lot easier to plan out sequencing when you know every single card your opponent's drawing. Yeah, so just to clarify a little bit of what happened there. The, uh, okay, well, <laughs> not much need for that. Mihara goes ahead and packs it in there under the uh, crushing suppression of the uh, Dragon Lord Silumgar. Yeah, Elder Dragon Legends, they learned a thing or two over the, all those years. And we're back to our main match here. We can see that not a great deal has happened thus far, just each player developing their mana base. Uh, fetch lands in the graveyard on both sides of things. Uh, looks like... Certainly, in terms of what um, Andrew Cunio is working with, he's in a pretty good spot. He's already got much of his late game sorted. He's got Dragon Lord Ojasai, he's got Elspeth, he's got a counter spell for now and a dig through time. On the other side of things, Justin Cohen, he's still kind of piecing things together because he's not got any kind of early acceleration. He has got Course of Crew Fix, but that's exactly the kind of thing that. Uh, Andrew Cunio's hand is fairly well set up to find ways of dealing with. Yep. So we've talked a few times about Corsair of Crufix being a card that the control player doesn't want to stick on the table 
Um, so we'll see whether Andrew decides to use a counter spell. And it looks like Dissolve is coming out here for Andrew. The other thing is, early in the game, when Andrew knows that he wants to hit extra lands so that he can get to the point of actually being able to deploy some of his bigger threats, the scry is not irrelevant in, in that Dissolve at all. Five mana, there's Dragon Lord Ojutai. Now, control decks don't necessarily love tapping out on their own turn, but Ojutai is a relatively safe tap out because while it's untapped, it does have Hexproof. And that when it's tapped and attacking, because it gets you a chance to look at the top three cards of the library and put one in your hand, it means that you can probably find ways of protecting yeah, it. Yeah, I really like running out the Dragon Lord Ojutai against a red-green deck. Cohen notably has stalled on lands, and Andrew has Valorous Stance here to protect his uh, Dragon Lord Ojutai, just giving a double check about what restrictions, um, uh, what is this, Rending Volley puts on what you can do to save your creature here. I believe it can't be countered and the damage can't be prevented, but you can make your creature indestructible with Valorous Stance, if I understand correctly. So here we have Andrew Cunio basically checking to make sure that everything works with the judges just before he tries to cast the spell because there's, there's some very specific sort of uh, nuances to how some of these cards work. Always safer to just confirm things with judges. And one of the things there is sort of you can be quite specific and being specific is probably for the best. If you say, can I cast this spell? Will it do anything? Yes, it will do something. It will give it indestructible. Now, will that keep the creature alive? Well, in this case, Yes, it will, but there's lots of variations on those themes. Can I choose to regenerate? You can pay the mana, but sometimes there might be things that might stop regeneration. It's, it makes sense to just ask very clearly. He's done that. He's cast his Valorous Stance, and Dragon Lord Ojutai is still hanging around, which is a big problem for Justin Cohen. So Andrew going through and getting to anticipate here as Dragon Lord Ojutai survives and connects. And we'll take a look at Andrew's hand for you shortly. Looks to me like he has a negate as another backup spell to protect Dragonlord Ojutai. That resolves. Yeah, Course of Crucifix, that one gets a quick that resolves from Andrew Cuneo because that's ultimately not really achieving as much in the matchup as various other things might. I mean, the land drop's certainly not unwelcome for Justin Cohen, but he's now staring down the barrel of the gun, and that barrel of the gun being a big dragon. So Cohen finally able to get unstuck on land. A little bit unfortunate for him, the sequence in there. He actually drew land off the top and revealed the land to the courser, so he's not able to deploy both of those in the same turn, but it does mean that he'll hit his land drops for the next couple turns. Um, we'll take a look at his hand for you here. So Cohen's plan, I, you know, in an ideal world, he'd be able to resolve something like a Storm Breath Dragon, probably as his first choice, um, or at least get on the board with a Xenoghost Reveler or a Whispered Elemental. Um, but Andrew Cunio frantically digging with Ojutai and uh, literally able to dig with Dig Through Time. I think we're going to see Andrew coming up with some counter spells that'll stop these powerful red green threats from resolving. And just to get that you know how things are going in our back table, uh, Marco Camaluzzi against Andrea Mengucci is a 75 card mirror, and quite fittingly, it's currently 1 1. They've each got a win under their belts. The point of difference will come in that third game where someone will walk away a victor. So, so Cohen pondering his plays on his own turn here. I think he wants to go for the Stormbreath Dragon. He likely knows that it's not going to resolve, but he's behind enough with his Dragonlord Ojutai hitting him turn after turn that I, I think he's, his best chance of winning is just to go for the Stormbreath Dragon, hope it resolves, and then he at least has a difficult-to-remove blocker that can stop the Ojutai from attacking. Yeah, protection from white is really the key thing there. I mean, initially when you first look at the Stormbreath Dragon, you might think 4-4, four, four, maybe that's not the best of uh, creatures to have in a straight-up fight against Dodge Tire. At best, it'll be able to trade. But actually, protection from white means it, it can block for as long as it likes. And sooner or later, going monstrous against control decks can actually be quite powerful. Absolutely. So we'll see if Cohen decides to pull the trigger on the Stormbreath here. I think that's the play that I would make. It's, again, not, not likely to actually resolve, given how many cards Kunio has drawn. But I think it's the best realistic option. And no, Cohen decides to go for the Whisperwood Elemental, a little bit more conservative there. Um, I guess his plan is that he still has one more turn, his next turn, to resolve the Stormbreath Dragon. And he's hoping to bait at least one counterspell out with the Whisperwood Elemental first. So yeah. definitely a reasonable line of play. I mean, speaking of baits, that, that's sort of one of the ways that potentially you can get around control decks. You don't play your best spell first. You say, I'm going to play something that's good enough that you need to deal with it in the hope that you can buy yourself some time or a window to be able to resolve the real important spell. 
Yeah, unfortunately, with Justin Cohen under so much pressure and Andrew drawing multiple cards a turn, I'm not sure that his window gets any better. Um, but yeah, it, it's definitely a reasonable line of play to try to bait one counterspell there and then this turn go for the Storm Breath, uh, but certainly an uphill battle uh, regardless of what line he chooses. Yeah, in some respects, I feel like each of these players very much playing a classic game of Magic. You've got Andrew Cuneo absolutely taking the control role. He's got the counter magic. He's got the card drawing. He's got the one persistent, difficult to deal with threat. And you've got Justin Cohen doing his best as an aggro role against these kind of decks, trying to sort of eke out the key permanents where he can. Now, as it turns out, even though he made a window for the Stormbreath Dragon, he may find himself out of luck here and anticipate from Andrew Cuneo in response to start with. Could it be this might actually resolve? Well, let's take a look at Andrew's hand. Um, he has a Disdainful Stroke already, so he's just anticipating for maximum information before pulling the trigger on the Disdainful Stroke. And while Justin Cohen can survive one more turn technically uh, with the one life he gained from his Courser, I think that the door is, is quickly slamming shut on the red-green deck's uh, chances here. It actually looks like Andrew just top deck an Ugin, is that? It d did appear to be Ugin the Spirit Dragon. And Ugin the Spirit Dragon is, of course, able to just simply point three points of colorless burn yeah. at Justin Cohen's head. That will be enough to... <laughs> Ugin the Lava Spike finishing the game. <laughs> yeah, an, an eight-mana Lava Spike, but it, it's not red, so protection from red will not help you. And a, a small nod there from Andrew Cuneo as he scoops his cards up. Just the one match left to see in the feature match area. And Marco Camaluzzi and um, Andrea Mengucci each just shuffling up before the final confrontation between uh, these two Abzan control decks. A 75-card mirror, not something that necessarily comes up too often, but these two may well have tested together, hence their identical lists. Let's take a look at those lists now for you. Abzan goes straight from control all the way to aggro in various different instances. This more the control end of things, so it's got Elspeth main deck, it's got Ugin, it's got Liliana Vess. Tassiga, Siege Rhino is kind of a given no matter which way you're looking, and then a whole bevy of removal spells. Now, the interesting bit after sideboarding is potentially you could either try and go underneath some of that, get a Fleece Main da line down, potentially give it indestructible, or go even bigger. So I'm going to have more Read the Bones to draw cards. I'm going to have Nissa World Waker. I'm going to be able to potentially do even bigger things than my opponent. It'll be interesting to see how this matchup goes, which way they've chosen to, to play it. Yeah, traditionally in these Abzan mirrors, uh, post sideboard, you want to slow things down a little bit and play more of a grindier game, uh, get some more card advantage. It's just too difficult to end the game with, uh, you know, attacking with things like Corsair of Crufix and uh, Fleece Main Lion. So I think we're going to see them bring in cards like you know, read the bones, uh, extra planes walkers, hand disruption, uh, and just try to get up on cards over one another. We see the details Although, there, Andrew. I guess, uh, uh, just jumping in right here, I guess uh, my, my prediction is totally wrong here. It looks like Minguchi has actually brought in the uh, Fleece Main Lions and is going for more of a beatdown plan. So I wonder if they're both on that plan, and they've talked about this before, um, or if Minguchi is th 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 throwing a curveball, so to speak, by bringing in some more aggressive creatures and trying to go underneath. I mean, the line's kind of interesting because if you leave it late enough, it does become powerful in a different way in as much as once it's indestructible, you have all sorts of problems as a control player dealing with it. Um, it may well be that he simply saw a window to cast it on turn two and, f and felt like it was worth taking. Um, he's now got the read the bones to draw him a couple of extra cards. But looking at his stats, um, Andrea Mangucci is up against Marco Camaluzzi. They've got a similar amount of overall winnings, but... Almost all of them for Andrea Mangucci came from just the one Pro Tour. Uh, not that long ago, he was our sort of real breakout King of the Hill. He, on the first day of his Pro Tour, he sat down at the King of the Hill table, basically didn't leave it all day, made top eight of that Pro Tour. And since then, he's been a real force and he's really helped a lot of um, other players in his area. He's a great, great limited player. He, I know he feels felt very strong about both limited and constructed in this format. Abzan Chan taking out the lion before it can threaten Monstrous. Uh, back to Minguchi with a Siege Rhino here. So Minguchi definitely playing um, one step ahead of the game here in terms of being a little bit more aggressive, getting creatures to stick on the battlefield. Uh, but Kamaluzzi looks like still has uh, plenty of gas in hand uh, and is well equipped to deal with the Siege Rhino. So, yeah, the yeah, and just goes ahead and <laughs> removes the Siege Rhino from the game, exiles it uh, in anticipation of an Abzan Chan. 
Yeah, I mean, this not necessarily a matchup where you would expect creatures to hang around for all too long. Um, Andre Mangucci at least was able to eke a little bit of value out of that Siege Rhino. He gained some life, most of which he is, well, all of which he is, in fact, now spent on a assorted Read the Bones over the course of the game. Gradually getting up on cards, though, and if you say that this is a, a grindy mirror, then whoever has more cards has to be in great spot. And by playing creatures, he's forced Kamalitsi to remove them rather than using his Abzan charms to draw cards. Yep, Read the Bones coming in here, definitely one of the best um, best cards post-sideboard in this matchup. Both players kind of just jockeying for card advantage and board position. Although Kamaluzzi not able to add anything proactive to the board in his turn. Uh, we'll see, Mengucci got a, a full grip here from these Read the Bones. Decides to go for a Courser rather than um, lead off with something more powerful. I think I see an Elspeth in his hand, um, but okay, his sixth land came into play tap. That's what I was missing there. So well, I think we'll see the Elspeth come down next turn then for Mengucci. It may well be that we don't see that um, course of Crufix hanging around for too long. There isn't a race in Kamaluzzi's hand, and I'm unsure as to exactly how many other targets there are in uh, Andrea Mengucci's deck that he would want to use it on over and above a course of Crufix. Yeah, I think you pretty much always take out a Corsair when you can with the removal spell in this matchup. You just can't afford to leave it on the table and let your opponent just get incremental advantage turn after turn. Uh, Mengucci's hand pretty well stocked here with Elspeth Sun Champion, which we're likely to see next turn. Uh, and even an Ugin the Spirit Dragon as a trump card when he eventually gets up to 8 mana. Kamaluzzi drawing some cards with Abzan Charm, hoping to continue making his land drops. And there we see that erase. That actually an Italian copy of erase, but we've got the English wording on there for you, just for your convenience. Um, it's interesting to note, actually, that on Andrea Mangucci's deck list, he's listed this as Gucci Zabzan. On uh, Marco Camaluzzi's list, it's just deck designer, oh. Day One MTG, the team that they both work with. So Elspeth Sun's champion coming down here. This is the biggest threat of the game thus far and bringing along with it three soldier tokens. And we're likely to see Mangucci match with his own Elspeth this turn. Now, in an Elspeth Sons champion fight, having the, the one in play first is a small advantage, right? It is. It left to their own devices. The uh, Elspeth that came into play first will end up ultimating first and end the game. But both players have so many cards in their hand that um, it's unlikely that the Elspeths are just going to go unchecked turn after turn. Uh, Mengucci here notably deciding not to play his own Elspeth and instead to answer, prioritize answering Marco Camaluzzi's Elspeth first. I believe he has an ultimate... Uh, sorry, um, he has an utter end in his hand, rather, which he's probably going to use right here to take out his opponent's Elspeth. Yeah, immediately cracking his windswept teeth. He can't really afford to be too coy about uh, managing the top card of his deck here because the longer the Elspeth hangs around, the more trouble she causes. And there goes utter end. Elspeth goes to exile, and there's a Siege Rhino on top of um, Andrea Mengucci's deck, which, considering that Marco Camaluzzi on just 10 life, could prove a little bit problematic for the Italian on the left of our screen. And I like the way Mengucci's been playing this game. He's sort of pacing out his threats, uh, making Kamaluzzi answer his less impactful cards, like Corsair of Crufix, before committing things like Elspeth Sun Champion um, and eventually Ugin to the battlefield. So kind of trying to bleed Kamaluzzi dry of answers uh, before he plays a Haymaker. Kamaluzzi is taking the opposite approach, where he's kind of leading off with his Elspeth uh, onto an empty board first, and I think Mengucci's probably on the better end of that situation, just being able to react to his opponent's stronger cards first before committing his own. And one thing that uh, Andrea Mangucci has the potential to do sometime quite soon is play more than one threat in a turn. He's got Tassiger, and one of the beauties of Tassiger, of course, being that it doesn't necessarily cost very much mana. We see here Kamaluzzi doing a similar sort of thing, getting a Tassiger into play. He's got enough mana to activate it with just an Abzan charm in the graveyard. So if it works out that uh, Tassiger gets activated for Kamaluzzi and there's just two lands go in, then Andrea Mengucci will be forced to return an Abzan charm to Marco Kamaluzzi's hand, and that a powerful option in this matchup. Can we get confirmation of player release here? So Andrea Mengucci here, having a little think. We see that in Kamaluzzi's hand there is an Ugin the Spirit Dragon and an Utter End in there. Both of those powerful options, but ultimately we've hit the stage in the game where it seems like almost everything that either player do is doing is a powerful uh, play. We see here Tassiger activating in response to uh, Ultimate Price. Two cards go into the graveyard. You can either choose one of the new Abzan Charms, the old Abzan Charm, or a Thoughtseize to put back in Marco Kamaluzzi's hand. 
and a testament there to the power of Andrea Mangucci's hand that he says, you can't have a thought seize, I will let you have one of those abs and charms. I guess at this point, paying two life to draw cards looks a little bit dicier when already on just 10 life. So Mingucci just pondering his play here on his main phase does decide to commit the Elspeth. Okay. And I think wisely so, given that he has an Ugin in hand as well uh, to follow up if this eats like a hero's downfall or an utter end or something along those lines. Uh, you know, he's got his next threat lined up and a more powerful one at that. Potentially, he might have figured out that, that one of the biggest things that Kamalutsi could do here is to play an Ugin, use it to get rid of Elspeth. Now, that's not going to work too well because he then gets to play his own Ugin and fire uh, a ghost fire at the original, the, the first Ugin, killing it off. That's right. Yeah, uh, that is an important Gaining sequence. Planeswalker advantage. So we're into the phase of the game where both players are just throwing haymakers at one another and sort of scrambling for answers to them. Um, the name of the game is going to be who runs out of answers first or, you know, who's able to stick the last haymaker. And that's where these card draw spells like Abzan Charm and Read the Bones are just so potent in that um, they let you, you know, just get up on action, get up on answers or up on threats over your opponent. And in this case, it seems like the, the plan from Marco Kumalotzi, I'm going to start off by drawing some cards and then Course of Crufix potentially giving him a way of winning back some of the life that he's been spending on... Uh, card drawing, immediately cast, playing a land after having cast his Abzan Tram to draw cards, going up to nine life. So both players sitting on an Ugin the Spirit Dragon in hand and just trying to maneuver um, and get ahead on the board with the other cards in their hand to pressure the opponent to react to the weaker cards before committing something like Ugin. Um, that said, if one player falls too, falls too far behind on the board, Ugin's going to come down and just clean everything up. And it looks like pretty soon Marco Camelucci is going to be in a position where he's going to need to commit his Ugin to the board. A very interesting matchup, this. This is one of those ones where it's not so often that during the Swiss rounds of a Pro Tour, each player can know literally every single card in the deck and sideboard of their opponent. It le means a whole extra level of sideboarding, potentially, as you try and second guess what opponents are doing. In this case, it seems like Andrea Mangucci has, a, has had the run of the cards, but potentially also a little bit of... Um, Smart play in terms of the addition of uh, Fleece Man. And down to his comes deck. Ugin here, sweeping up the board. Now, importantly, Ugin, as you mentioned, Tim, is going to have to minus six here, which brings it down to one. Uh, that's going to allow Menguchi on the following turn to potentially play his own Ugin and plus two, destroying Kamaluzzi's Ugin. And in the middle there, Andrea Menguchi was able to activate Tasiga and get back an Arbzan charm. <laughs> I think that there might just be a moment where, uh, because Tasiga was activated before Ugin resolved, uh, effectively there was a brief moment that Kamalutzi should have seen one more card from Menguchi's deck. They're just making oh, sure great that all works out. Yeah, that, that must have been what they were discussing. Uh, head judge uh, Riccardo Tessitore, uh, obviously able to listen to them explain all of this in fluent Italian, which conveniently for the pace of this match is very, very quick indeed. So Ugin ticks up to nine taking out his, his mirror Ugin on the other side of the board. Kamaluzzi following up with just a Corsair of Crufix. Um, not too potent by itself, but it does reveal Elspeth's Sun Champion uh, potentially coming out the following turn. And there's the utter end for Ugin. So Ugin's not hanging around too long on this board, um, but we see that there are two copies of Siege Rhino in uh, Andrea Mangucci's hand. So he is very, very close to being able to close out this game. He's got a couple of other cards in there as well. I believe there's an Absan Charm he got back with Tassiger. So lots of gas in the tank for Andrea Mengucci. But there's an, only about three minutes left in this round. So for Kamalutzi especially, this is going to be a problematic position to be in. Skryland there from uh, Mengucci quickly putting a land on the bottom instead seeing just a regular try land in Stansep Citadel on top. So two copies of Siege Rhino in Mengucci's hand means that uh, he's got essentially six points of direct damage. Um, Kamaluzzi being at seven life, that represents all but one of his life points. However, he does have uh, Corsair of Crufix to recover a little bit of life. We'll see if it's going to be in time. 
Uh, Camelutzi has an answer for one of the two Siege Rhinos in the form of Hero's Downfall, but his ultimate price, unable to kill Siege Rhino because it is not a monocolored creature. It's interesting, actually, since Ultimate Price came back, that sort of these black removal spells almost characterized by what they can't kill. And in this case, Ultimate Price not quite as powerful as I think it was the first time around, really. Yeah, and that's one of the things we try to play up a lot um, in development in R&D is giving you different choices with your removal spells, each of which has certain holes in what it, it can and cannot hit. Um, so that you have to predict the metagame a little bit, and as the metagame shifts, so too does your removal suite. Yeah, it's a similar thing with counter magic, right? Like, a negate is much more interesting than a flat-out counter spell because you actually have to make more choices. Yeah, or something like Disdainful Stroke, while great against a Planeswalker control deck, isn't effective against Mono Red. So down comes Elspeth, Sun's Champion, with a minus three, taking out one of the Siege Rhinos. So that, that was the second answer that Kamaluzzi needed. Now, combined with Hero's Downfall in his hand, he is able to weather the two Siege Rhinos um, there. Of course, that'll knock him down to just one life. That said, it looks like uh, Andrea Mangucci wants to start things out by uh, drawing a few cards here. I mean, it also could have been tempting, I suppose, to put counters on his um, Corsa. Yeah, so he I could was actually thinking just the same in. thing. You could potentially attack Elspeth. Uh, Kamaluzzi would likely block, and then you could add two counters to your Corsa, uh, killing his Corsa in combat. But I think drawing the cards here is the right play, um, whether or not I would have done it myself. <laughs> I, I'm always tempted by those sorts of plays, and we see that actually there was a hero's downfall in the draw for Mangucci here, and that means that at least Elspeth not to worry, and there's enough mana for that Siege Rhino. So Marco Camaluzzi here, living off the top of his deck, really, and we can see the top of his deck is a Liliana Vess. So Liliana could potentially minus two to tutor up an answer um, to the Siege Rhino. And there's just under one minute left on this round. Uh, has to be said that this looks to favor Andrea Mangucci. He's certainly got more draws, live draws to actually win this game, but it's entirely possible that Marco Camaluzzi may be able to find the right combination of removal to force a draw here. Yeah, Camaluzzi, I, I'd forgotten he used the Elspeth to take out the first Siege Rhino, so he does still have that hero's downfall to answer the second. Uh, and now, in addition, has Liliana to tutor up um, either a follow-up threat or a follow-up answer. Now, the funny bit about this, of course, is that with Corsa Krivix in play, he actually, the thing he tutors <laughs> up and puts on top of his deck will be completely visible to Andrea Mengucci. Yep. Perfect information for uh, Andrea Mengucci here. So Mengucci out of cards in hand, I believe. Um, it's got to be frustrating here with Kamaluzzi, just that one life, now two life um, off the Corsair. Yeah, it looks like actually uh, Kamaluzzi chose to force a discard from Andrew Mangucci to empty out his hand because he knew he had that hero's downfall. Time has now been called, though, so we do not have much time left on this game. Oh, sorry, that's time on the main round, sorry. Oh, it sounds like our feature matches were running more or less at the same time as the, uh, the main clock. It is time in the feature match also. So here goes Liliana with minus two, using her Vampiric Tutor style ability. Uh, to find whatever card Kamaluzzi wants and put it on top of his library. Uh, we, of course, as the viewers and also Minguchi, will get to see what that card is because of the Corsair of Crufix, and it is a Siege Rhino. Worth noting, of course, this Vampiric Tutor ability does not cost Kamaluzzi two life, right. just two loyalty on Liliana. If it did, it would not be nearly as good in this so situation. Huge pickup here from Minguchi, a copy of Tassiger. Uh, he's deciding what to delve here. Um, Delving, of course, stripping away cards that he doesn't want returned to his hand with Tassiger's ability. And it looks like his goal here is going to be to try to recycle Siege Rhinos and finish off Kamaluzzi. Now, we are on turn zero right now, I believe, of extra turns. So, Minguchi, uh, this, turn, is, this turn is turn one. one, actually. So, he has uh, two more turns after this to finish off his opponent. And I think what he's going to want to try to do is recycle Siege Rhinos. Yeah, so bizarrely, this is a situation where at the point that Andrea Mengucci activates Tassica, he's really hoping to just find a couple of lands. Yep. Although Nissa World Waker. Um, does Nissa help? Interesting. It? Uh, I mean, it does in the sense that it makes hasty, trampoly creatures uh, turn after turn, um, which could eventually punch through. Although, with Kamaluzzi having a Siege Rhine on the top of his library, uh, that does have five toughness. The lands only have four power. Um, so, yeah, it, it's not totally clear to me what Kamaluzzi wants to give back to him, but it looks like he's chosen a Siege Rhino. And I guess that with the Siege Rhino on top, he kind of sees those two as a push. Um, 
it may prove that um, Mengucci here not quite able to squeak out the final few points as head judge Ricardo Tessitore looks on from the background there in his red shirt. So if Mengucci plays the Siege Rhino this turn, Kamaluzzi will go down to one life. Uh, he can pass the turn back to Kamaluzzi. He'll draw a Siege Rhino of his own, bringing him back up to four. Uh, he's got two Coursers of Crufix in play to potentially gain two more life if he finds a land on top. And it's, it's hard to see from this camera angle, but it looks like Mingucci activated Tassiger a second time, getting back Utter End, I believe. Yes. So he did not cast any Siege Rhino that turn. He saw that it's sort of they weren't necessarily going to improve his situation too much that turn. Uh, Kamalozzi drew Sword Duress on the top of his deck. He does have the option again of using Liliana this turn too, so he will be getting an extra draw before this game is over. Kamaluzzi not having the luxury of being able to sit back on Siege Rhinos. He does have to cast this one because if there ends up being a situation where Andrea Mangucci gets a second, he could have just cast two to end the game. So this puts Kamaluzzi up to seven. Andrea Mangucci down to a pretty healthy 24. So an interesting choice with Liliana here. Now, head Kamaluzzi plus the Liliana, Mangucci would have to discard one of the two cards in his hand, which uh, he'd then be able to give him back with Tassiger. Uh, it looks like these two friends have sort of turned around and said, this match is not going to end. Uh, we're not, we're not going to play out the last couple of turns. A little kind of high five across the table. Kind of fitting that two teammates playing a 75 card mirror ends up in a draw, even if it's not necessarily the most exciting for either of them in terms of their potential finish in the tournament right now. So that the end of our, of our round here, round 12 here at Pro Tour Fate Reforged. Myself, Tim Willoughby here with Ian Duke. And we saw an awful lot of great magic and really a bit of a school in terms of how control plays against all sorts of different decks. We heard about Shota Yasuoka falling to mono red. We saw an absolute decimation of, um, of the Bees deck from Andrew Cuneo on, on yep. blue-white control. And then, of course, Paolo Vittor Damodorosa doing his thing with blue, black, or actually Esper control there. So many different forms of control. Mm -hmm. All of them seem pretty powerful in this format. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's really interesting to me how you have so many different choices between um, what subset of the Esper colors you play, whether or not you're playing dragons, if you decide to use Crux of Fate and how that impacts whether you're using dragons as finishers, um, whether you're going for a more Planeswalker-oriented route. We've also seen some copies of Narset over the weekend, mm -hmm. which none of the players that we featured this round happened to choose, but it's another option for a package you can use in a control deck. Absolutely. I, there's a big enough suite of good cards that control decks can run that it does kind of work out that you can't necessarily predict just because your opponent's playing control what 75 they're playing with. Yeah. But this is the end of our round 12. We are going to head things back to the news desk, but we will see you very, very shortly for round 13 of Pro Tour. Thanks very much to Tim Willoughby and Ian Duke. They're kicking us off with our Saturday afternoon entertainment of Standard. Where are the dragons in the feature match area? Let's wheel out the dragon tracker, set a furnace under it, and see where we get to. Here we come. 58 dragons now have been in the feature match area here in Pro Tour Dragons of Tarkir. I want to mention, by the way, that draw between Kamaluzzi and Mengucci. Well, you know what? Sure, one point not great, but that's another whole round closer to the end of the tournament where they still don't have to win their next match. They're both at 9-2-1. and one. They both have a loss to give, and another hour has ticked by. So there is that going for them. Now, time to wheel out our hashtags here at the Pro Tour, because on our second afternoon, all the races are coming into view. Three of them for you. You see them along the bottom of your screen there. Fantasy Pit PT, give us three players you think could be in the mix tomorrow. That competition's getting a little bit easier, I think you'll agree, as we're down to 40 or 50 players who could make it. Top five cards, well, that one's a lot tougher. What have been the standout cards of the Pro Tour? You might decide to focus on Limited, or just what do you think the best five cards of the whole weekend have been? And finally, best deck. Well, that's going to come into focus as we head down the stretch this afternoon and, of course, tomorrow when it's standard all the way. But right now here on the Pro Tour, it is deck tech time. Waiting for us is Hall of Famer Randy Bueller and a teenage wonderkind from the Czech Republic who already has one Pro Tour top eight to his name. Can he make it two? He's in great position to do so so far. It's Andre Strasky.